So I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman. I'm a family doctor. I have a CLL and I'm a, a doctor turned patient. I'm Dr. John Bird. And I'm a professor of medicine at the Ohio State University and I direct the division of hematology and, and I'm interested in bringing new drugs and new approaches forward for CLL patients. An exciting year at ASH. What's got your attention? Well, this has just been you know, a phenomenally exciting year at ASH. Yeah, you know, so we're seeing you know, major, advance, major advances with the non-chemotherapy-based approaches with long-term follow-up you know, presented with, you know, presented with ibrutinib, the combinations, you know, the combination studies with the GS1101 uh, molecule, new BCL2 antagonists, and, you know, say, you know, the CAR-T therapy, you know, you know warming up, uh, you know, per se. We're still very early in that story, but, you know, we're seeing more results and, say, we'll, you know, we'll be seeing those hopefully this afternoon as we go to these, you know, to the pre presentation showing, you know, the, you know, the results. So let, let's start with the, um, the buzz about these new small molecules, these um, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the, the story on them and how you, uh, how, where they're at now and how you see them fitting in? Yeah, I, I think, I think um, all patients want that magic bullet. And the, the teaser you know, was in you know to other to other cancers and to leukemias was CML in the 90s, where patients were getting chemoimmunotherapy for CML, and many of the young people had to go on to transplant to be cured of their disease, or they were going to die from their disease. And and Gleevec, a pill came along, and you know an updated paper from MD Anderson showed that you know the patients with CML now can live, you know, have an estimated uh, survival of 86 percent on that oral medicine at eight years. You know, so a phenomenal, you know, a phenomenal result, considering that's all causes of death, and probably very few people with that oral medicine now are relapsing with their, you know, with their CML. So we've wanted that in CLL, and, and because we want to get away from chemotherapy, say, you know, and I think a lot of the biologic evidence points to. That chemotherapy may even be damaging. It may select out more aggressive clones of CLL, and so, yeah, you know, we've the, you know the targeted agents you know, for CLL have been lacking because CLL is a much more complicated disease, and you know a lot of the basic research has has brought us to you know the B cell receptors you know, signaling pathway, and you know really at this meeting we saw you know develop I mean the, this sort of the mature results of. A couple of agents that target this, you know, just in a similar way that Gleevec targeted BCR able in CML, and you know, I, if I if if I would if I would talk about what really has gotten my you know has gotten my heart beating fast, thinking to the future and you know great promises, you know the the results of the first you know that 31 uh, patient cohort in the ibrutinib trial uh, that was presented yesterday. Where you know at you know the estimated progression-free survival that means on med either on medicine or if a few people had to stop medicine, but free of disease at 26 months is 96 percent. Now, Brian, that's so. If we look at if we look that's at unbelievable. if we look at patients over the age of 65 with bendamustine rituximab, we'd be expecting that number to be close to 50 percent. You don't need a status. You, you don't need a statistician to see, um, you know that that those results are you know are very dramatic and you know and so hopefully, hopefully those those results are going to you know lead to you know a you know a phase three study that gets you know this agent approved and you know in you know as an initial therapy for you know for CLL you know and we'll be you know we'll be on our way to hopefully having patients being treated for their CLL with targeted therapies. And not chemotherapy. So let me take you a step back and just help me understand why this BCR. I mean, I, I saw an interview with Rick Furman, who did some, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be talking to Rick later, some of the um, early research, and I think he was surprised at how effective ibrutinib was. So tell me a little bit about why blocking the BCR, in a, and I understand it's a B cell yeah. cancer, why, why does it make such a dramatic effect. Yeah. Well, so I think I think everybody was surprised, you know, and you know, at, at the beginning, about how well these drugs have worked because you know when you look at them, 
in the traditional way that we look at you know, drugs in the laboratory, they looked like they were going to be modest players. Um, you know, they didn't look like they were going to be as promising as they are. And you know, part of it is, you know, they work, you know, they work by telling the cell to die. They say, you know, so they signal the cell to die. They block the cells from growing. And you know, they probably, you know, I think what we're going to learn, you know, what we're going to learn with time with some of these two, is they also modulate you know, the immune system in a favorable, you know, in a favorable way. Where you know, said the immune system can help because you know, so the, you know, the immune system is is a very, very important component of how you know our bodies prevent us from getting cancers every day. You and I have cancers, other, different cancers that develop in us every day. Right. And um, and you know, these drugs help restore the immune system, you know, which can help in the fight with the drug. And and you know, so I think I think it's a complicated, you know, it's it's complicated. And say, hopefully, we're going to be left with the, you know, the fun challenge of figuring out how these drugs are working so well for the next decade. It's much, it's much funner doing that than trying to, you know, than trying to you know, figure out how drugs are, that are not working we can make them work better. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I like that a lot. And there was it was certainly interesting to see some of the uh, papers that. Uh, uh, and uh, poster presentations that uh, dealt with these um, sort of the BCR being jammed on and the um, you know auto stimulation and but you know what's amazing is we've had the answer probably for a couple of decades. Oh, really? It, it, uh, when, when you when you look yeah. back at the mouse models, uh -huh. where different components of the B cell receptor you know, were knocked out genetically, the mice didn't develop the, you know the mice didn't develop B cells or they had very impaired B cell function, and you know, and you know, the good, you know, the fact that the mice could live for you know with this told us it was probably going to be something that's druggable, and so it's just it's nice, you know, it, it's nice how science works that sometimes you can go back and you, you know, and find in 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 old data, to, you know, say a new interpretation, you know, say of of a finding, you know, that you know that ultimately can translate. So, these are oral medications. Uh, and uh, there, one of the other advantages from a patient's point of view is the um, adverse event profile. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I think in general the adverse events with 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 uh, both of the you know the active oral kinase inhibitors GS1101 and ibrutinib are you know are you know, very modest relative to what we would expect with you know with other therapies that we give. I mean, you do see adverse events. You know, and I think yesterday in the presentation that I presented with ibrutinib, and you know, say, my collective experience with GS1101 would be the same. You know, as that the side effects you often see. So, for instance, the diarrhea with you know the diarrhea with ibrutinib. You know, when you look at it the first two months, it's 20 percent. When you look at it after two months, it's two percent. Um, the infections with that. I mean, and that was this was this was the, the neatest finding because we know the CLL patients. We don't. We lose more CLL patients to infections right. than we lose them to their disease. And, and, and this and, blocks your and, making gamma globulins. Right. So. And and so you would think, oh, this. Oh, with time, this is just going to be a disaster. You're going to see more and more infections. You know. And in fact, what we you know what we saw was that the that you know the patients getting ibrutinib during the first you know during the first six months of of you know, treatment, you know their frequency of infections was uh, you know that required you know that required. A hospitalization was 7.1 per 100 patient months, which is what, about what you would expect to see in a refractory CLL patient. You know, after you know, say after six months, it dropped to 2.6 wow. per you know, you know per 100 patient months. So it's a very significant drop. And to me, it gets back to what we were talking about. It's reflective of these targeted medicines, you know, sort of shutting the CLL down, which is immunosuppressive in its on its own. And allowing you know the, you know the normal immune system to come back you know and not only protect from you know not only protect from and, and help fight the CLL potentially but also but also you know to protect the patients from infection. Right, let's take a quick pause here. Sure. All right.